and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. My name's Tom Rivikarnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. Today, we're going to discuss the adaptation and resilience agenda. How can the world reach a place where it is more resilient to the changes that we're now going to experience to ensure that we can still thrive in the coming decades? Plus, we speak to Emma Howard Boyd, Chair of the Environment Agency and Commissioner on the Global Commission on Adaptation with overall responsibility for adaptation in the UK. Thanks for being here. So today we're going to talk about adaptation, and this is the first time that we've covered this topic in this podcast. So far, we have always talked to some degree about what we call mitigation, which is the attempt to stop emitting climate changing gases into the atmosphere. But there is another very important part of the climate debate, and that is around adaptation. Adaptation is the process by which we can evolve human systems, natural systems, in order to prepare for the changes that are now inevitable in our climate. There will be, whatever we do, there will be some degree of warming in the coming decades. That will mean changes in rainfall patterns, it will mean changes in crop yields, it will mean rising sea levels. And if we're going to stay in a place where we can effectively manage climate change, we're going to have to adapt to those changes. Now, next week, the Global Commission on Adaptation, which is a, a global project that was brought together by 20 heads of state, is going to release its flagship report. That report is going to go in detail into what needs to happen over the coming decades in order to get on top of this. So we're going to, in anticipation of that, and it's a great report. I know it doesn't always sound that exciting, but you should read this report when it comes out on Tuesday. Um, in anticipation of that, we're going to dig into this issue and understand the parameters. Christiana, you are a commissioner on the Global Commission on Adaptation. What's your perspective? You know, Tom, adaptation is as important as mitigation under the convention, but certainly for countries. And it's actually quite uh, remarkable that adaptation has always been the Cinderella in any climate change discussion. I actually think that there are two reasons for that. One is historical and one is current and continues. The historical reason, I think, is that it was the developing countries that originally brought this topic to the table because they are the most impacted. They were the ones that saw the negative impacts of climate change before the industrialized and recognized them as being impacts of climate change. And they were the ones that brought it to the table, but they actually didn't get too much of a microphone on that. So that's the historical reason. The current reason why it still continues to be the Cinderella is that in the past 10 years, we have figured out a pretty compelling business model to invest in certainly in renewable energy, increasingly into energy efficiency, certainly into electric vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the mitigation uh, opportunities have a pretty compelling business model attached to them. Hence, they attract finance. But adaptation doesn't. And adaptation, it's basically you're throwing money into the sea if you're building a seawall. You're throwing money onto the wetlands if you are trying to do something to control floods. And we have not figured out what the business model is for adaptation. Hence, it's very difficult to attract funding, certainly for investment, and we are left with public funding that, as we know, is pretty scarce. So it's very sad because adaptation is really crucial and it is urgent and it continues to be dramatically undercapitalized. Hmm. I mean, what, what can I say? Of course, I agree with you, Christiana. And, you know, I'm going to confess that in my 19 years or something working on climate change, I, I really, certainly for the first 15 years, I actually kind of didn't worry about adaptation. And the reason for that is that I kind of figured people would have to do it. Like mitigation, you know, people don't have to necessarily reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But, you know, if the sea is coming to get you, then you, then you have to adapt uh, uh, but actually it was, uh, uh, my friend, Nick Robbins, uh, who, who, uh, actually pushed 
me and my organization to say, no, you've really got to take into account adaptation. And of course he was right. And I started thinking about adaptation and I'm going to use a kind of weird Darwinian analogy, if I may, but I have this idea that, you know, we're doing all of this adaptation, adaptation, and I feel that the adaptation body kind of over time will eventually evolve a mitigation brain, if that makes any sense. You know, you keep putting up these seawalls and all this kind of stuff. And then eventually you're going to think, well, actually we need to stop the stuff coming out of the, out of the smokestacks. We need to stop the, 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 the greenhouse gas emissions uh, if we want to deal with it. And there's a funny phrase that uh, somebody said, you know, if, if, if something's true in reality, it must be true in, in theory. And I recall actually <laughs> at a, a CDP launch, um, 2007, a major phrase, frozen pea company uh, in the UK was talking about how they were moving their their processing centres north, constantly north, because uh, where the, where the product was growing was changing. So, well. To conclude my little adaptation summary, um, there's a fantastic report recently by BlackRock, the major insure, uh, the major asset manager, talking about assets of, of you know at sea level can, probably won't be insured soon, and so you have to look through them to their values. That's a kind of capitalist take on it, but actually, what rips your heart out is thinking about how people in developing countries uh, are going to have to move, and and the crisis of refugees that we've discussed before uh, becomes ever more serious and, and troubling. Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I think it's, it's very interesting. And, you know, what you said earlier, Christiana, about um, the fact that there's no business case, um, to just sort of pick up on that, and or, or the business case is not as apparent as it is for mitigation, where there's a very obvious investment and then revenue flow from that investment, which deploys capital. It's a really interesting problem, that, because just picking up a couple of the statistics that are in this report that's coming out next week. One is that, you know, it seems likely that climate change could suppress agricultural yields by as much as 30% by 2050. So if you imagine that confluence of factors between the population growth that we're going to experience between now and 2050, combined with, you know, the impacts of climate change, meaning that agricultural output is a third lower, then at a big scale, there could not be a more compelling business case for anything than to make sure that doesn't happen. But I think what we're talking about here is that doesn't translate down to the level of the individual investor who's being asked to put down capital. Is that what you're saying? Well, the other thing that I'm saying is that those damages, future jam- damages, are not internalized into today's investment right. decisions. Mm, yeah. Um, they're not given, they're not monetized, right? They they are analyzed, they're put out there, but it doesn't really affect net present value, uh, sadly, and it should. And, and so, you know, it just sort of remains there in the theory. Um, and that's so true for many other things uh, that related to climate change that we have not monetized or internalized either the cost or the benefit. Because if we did... We would have very different policies, yeah. but we're still with very, very traditional valuations of what value is and what a cost is, and hence we make very erroneous decisions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I will just push back a little bit on that. On, on, on. I mean, in in some of the the richer countries, people really are looking at. Um, property particularly near uh you know low lying uh sea level you know where where storm surges can destroy it so th- that is being factored in but i take your point you know in in the great bulk of the kind of uninsured world the less monetized world it's not being taken into account at all well not enough yeah and i think that you know in, in order for us to find a way through this um you know and again this is draws from what's coming out next week but you know there's a human element to this which you've talked about there's a really heartbreaking human story that could unfold here without careful attention from the world um there's an environmental story because of course once degradation happens then that facilitates further degradation and there's an economic story because of the massive impact that it could have on the ability of the future economy to kind of make sense for all the people on the planet so you know, I think that wrapping this into the mitigation story um, is going to be really important because it's going to have to be governments that find a way to finance that along with, you know, I mean, I think also it is worth pointing out, Christiana, you know, you said building a seawall, you kind of throw the money into the into the sea or, or whatever it is. There's no business case. There are actually investors that are figuring out how to do this. And there are kind of resilience funds um, that are developing pipelines of projects that investors are now putting money into to try to improve the resilience of infrastructure. So I think there's a lot 
of kind of creative thinking that's going on in this direction. Macquarie is doing a lot in that direction at the moment, and, for example. And sadly, most of that is occurring in the global north. True. That's yeah. really sad because to to Paul's point about he didn't, for many years, he didn't think about adaptation because he just assumed that we would have to do it. Well, all very well and true in industrialized countries. But you can understand the logic of the argument that comes from developing countries who say, wait a second, neither did we cause climate change and we are the ones that are being most affected. And hence, there is the need for us to apply very, very scarce resources to defend ourselves against a threat that was caused by the countries of the North. How logical is that? And how fair is that? So to yeah. assume that developing countries, you know, will just have to adapt and that they have to take that out of their own pocket is a wrong assumption. Okay, but here's a little bit of optimism. <laughs> uh, it is the <laughs> case last. that uh, last night on CNN, uh, there was a major uh, climate special where leading uh, presidential candidates on the Democratic side talked about the problem of climate change. And so when the world's greatest economy is, you know, their, 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 their political leaders or potential political leaders are, are discussing the issue. That's a reason for us to be very positive in our thinking about the future, if not the past so far. Well, that's the truth. That's the first time in history, actually, that CNN organizes a at least a pre-candidate discussion on climate change. Um, and uh, it, it's actually um, quite sad that Jay Inslee, that we interviewed on this podcast several months ago, he is the, the um, pre-candidate who brought this topic most vehemently on to the political agenda in the Democratic Party. Um, but he withdrew his participation just, I think, a week ago or a few days ago, just before this, um, this conversation or this discussion on CNN last night. So um, he must have been sitting there watching this <laughs> and saying, I told you so. Although what's interesting about that um, is if you... So since he pulled out, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, Beto O'Rourke have all come out with very significant climate plans. Elizabeth Warren's is a $3 trillion plan. And they are based very closely on Jay Inslee's ideas that he proposed earlier in the campaign. So, you know, I think that his campaign, even though it's ended, um, you know, was historic in the sense that it was based on this issue. And I think it's influenced the others. And, you know, not only is this the first climate debate, we should also remember last time round, the climate wasn't even mentioned in any of the debates. And this time it has its own debate. It's, a, it's amazing the difference in just a few years. It is amazing. Yeah. So in the UK, uh, the person who has responsibility for this issue of adaptation uh, is a woman called Emma Howard Boyd, who actually we've all known for many years. Um, the Environment Agency is the regulator of environmental quality in the UK. It's the equivalent of what the EPA is in the United States. Um, so... In that role, Emma kind of travels around the country. She's responsible for floods. Uh, she looks at different impacts and how to manage them around, you know, um, not enough water, too much water, etc. So she's got a really interesting perspective on the sharp end of what does this mean, as well through the Global Commission on Adaptation with a perspective of what it means in other countries around the world. So it's great to be able to go and talk to her. Um, let's go and have the conversation. Let's do it. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. I'm delighted to be here with you. <laughs> so we have been doing this podcast for some months now, but we've not yet really got into this conversation about adaptation. And it's so interesting because obviously climate impacts are coming. There is a degree of impact we're going to have to adapt to. So we're really pleased to be talking to you. You're so central to this issue through the Global Commission on Adaptation and also through your day job at the... At, um, the Environment Agency. Um, so we'd like to dig into all of that. Christiana's going to kick off with the first question and we want to have a discussion about your motivations, your history and sort of where do we think it's going from here. So thanks for being here and Christiana, over to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Emma, I would also like to thank you for joining us on Outrage and Optimism. Tom has already mentioned that we haven't done a podcast on adaptation and I think it would be very helpful if we can hear from you. 
what is adaptation? What is the concept of adaptation? Because honestly, when most people talk about climate change, they immediately think about reducing emissions. We do not immediately think about how are we going to adjust to the changing conditions. So I would love to hear the challenge of adaptation in lay terms so that we can all understand Well, Christiana, I'm delighted to try and have a go at explaining (laughs) adaptation because I think one of the issues we all face when we discuss climate change and the climate crisis is some of the terminology and the jargon that we use. And here at the Environment Agency, where we are present up and down the country in communities, it's really important that we are using a language that all people can understand. And one of the simplest terms that we've started using is about being prepared for climate change, about being climate ready. And that can come in all different shapes and forms. So just briefly about the Environment Agency, we are the environmental regulator here in England. But we also have responsibility for flood and coastal erosion risk management. And that is where a lot of our work on the adaptation and resilience agenda is focused. But as the environmental regulator, we are also regulating the water sector. And there we flip onto the too little water discussion, whereas flood and coastal erosion uh, risk management is very much about too much water. And really, as we talk about the physical risks of climate change that are building up, in very simplistic terms, it's the too hot, the too cold, the too wet, the too dry, throw in a little bit of fire in there as well. And how we help anybody anywhere start preparing for those risks that we're going to start seeing in ever increasing amounts. We're seeing it virtually every day at the moment. Mm. And and Emma, how do we do that? Because it's quite difficult to foresee the intensity or the frequency of those risks, of those impacts. It's also very difficult to foresee exactly where in the geography of any country or in the geography of the world um, these are going to hit us. So it, it seems to me that you have a pretty difficult job in preparing people and infrastructure uh, for potential events that could occur or could not occur and could occur at a much higher level and higher frequency than that which you have prepared. This is a very convoluted way of asking you, is it actually possible to adapt to climate change in an effective way in under any scenario? I think one of the things that we rely on increasingly is data. And certainly when it comes to our flood work, one of the things we did about 10 years ago was set up a joint venture with the Met Office to um, develop flood forecasting because it's not just about the rainfall events that we're experiencing, the storm events that we're experiencing, sometimes coupling that with Uh, surge events, uh, particularly at the coast, but also understanding how much uh, capacity there is inland to absorb water. And so that combination of weather forecasting alongside understanding what capacity there is in the land Mm. to uh, help model whether we're going to see flooding. So it is complex, but I think the more we understand about the physical impacts of of climate change, the more we can start preparing communities to watch out for the events that are going to take place. And certainly what triggered a lot of the early work, not just here in the UK, but in parts of um, Europe, specifically the Netherlands, was a flooding event, a tidal surge back in 1953. And what happened as that event took place overnight, which led to a, a number of fatalities, both here in the UK, but also in the Netherlands, was the fact that we weren't able to share information. So 
one of the key strands of the work that we're doing here, but also other parts of the world are focusing on, is the warning and informing. Mm. And in other parts of the world, like Bangladesh, like the Philippines, the way we have worked together, different governments around the world to help different parts of the world to build up that early warning system has started to make a significant difference in the way people can respond to an event. Mm. Again, sticking with flooding, we, it's also how we evolve what happens once a community has flooded. And there, it's also about building back better and building back for the next event, whether it's a hurricane or a, a rainfall event causing flooding or some other catastrophic um, damage. It's making sure that when you are building back those communities, you're really understanding the way you can help those communities be more resilient so that they can move back into their houses, assuming their, their houses are still standing in a much more, uh, in a much quicker way. And that's where you need to start working with the insurance industry and with building regulations as well, that are we thinking about what's coming next? Yeah. And then ultimately, we may face really difficult choices about do we build back in a different place because actually the risks have become so large uh, you can't build forever greater walls to keep out the water you may need to make some very difficult decisions over time as to whether communities need to move to different places yeah and that's that's such an interesting point, isn't it? Because so next week, this report is coming out from the Global Commission on Adaptation, which you're a commissioner, you've represented the UK on for the duration. And one thing I was struck by in reading that report is just the scale of some of the impacts. And they may be a decade or two away, but, you know, very significant drops in crop yield output of like up to 30%. And talking about, you know, an additional one and a half billion people struggling to get regular access to water... Um, I mean, we all know that these things are coming and you're, you see these things day to day as you travel around the UK, travel around the world. Do you think we have any sense of what's required to get ready for that future yet? That's why I think this report that's being published next week is so important. Mm. And when I was invited to be the UK's commissioner, having, I, I suppose, been leading the Environment Agency as its chair for the previous few years, I realised how important it was to get adaptation and resilience on the global agenda in the way that we have so successfully, and Christiana, you've had a, played a huge part in this, got the low carbon transition mm. so firmly on the global agenda. So given the co-chairs, Ban Ki-moon, Bill Gates and Kristalina Georgieva and the different governments and individuals but also representatives from the public, private and third sector, I felt this was such an important opportunity mm. to get this subject firmly on the global agenda because whilst there's no doubt we've seen more events and there's no doubt we're seeing more investment in better protecting communities and businesses. We still, in my view, are not doing enough to make sure that any investment that we're making really anywhere in the world is looking through that future lens of are we protecting our assets and to your point about farmers and farming yeah. communities our supply chains mm. this is about how we will live and be fed into the future and next week is a real opportunity to get that um, focus on the adaptation agenda firmly on the global agenda uh, for everybody and the whole world's benefit. Nice. Um, Emma, as you know, I come from a developing country um, and I think the concerns that you have expressed are just so immensely magnified when it comes to developing countries because um, there is such an injustice here. A, the in developing countries have as a whole not contributed certainly not as much to climate change as industrialized countries. B, because of where most of them are placed in the tropical areas of the world, they are being hit more 
than the temperate countries uh, by uh, the natural uh, extreme events uh, such as hurricanes, cyclones, um, and their infrastructure is not as firmly um, rooted, is not as strongly built as the infrastructure of industrialized countries. And on top of all of that, they have fewer resources with which to either reconstruct or, in the best of all cases, many fewer resources to protect themselves and to uh, put uh, the necessary conditions in place to be ready for these impacts. So uh, how how do you think about the fate of developing countries and how does this report treat that uh, very, very different situation between developing and developed countries? Well, I think this is where it gets very complex. But again, from my perspective, what being the UK commissioner has an, allowed me to do is work in uh, across different government departments. And I think that is something that, again, we can all benefit from putting adaptation and resilience in the heart of government decision making wherever you are in the world. So I've learned a huge amount about what we can do domestically from working with government colleagues in different departments where their focus has been much more on international development. I think we know that cl climate change does not know borders. So again, by highlighting how important it is for those developing countries to be uh, looked after in the adaptation agenda, it will also hopefully make sure that more leaders in the developed world understand what we are all going to be facing in ever increasing quantities over the months and years to come. And I am hopeful that by pushing, making this tr a truly global discussion, that some of those inequalities that you've talked about, Christiana, start being properly addressed as we uh, work in the next decade, trying to get on track for a one and a half degree world because right. the one of the easiest ways to adapt is to make sure that this is not about dialing down on our work for the low carbon transition. We've got a double, treble, quadruple our efforts there, but at the same time, make sure that we are building those resilience methods into the way we are developing our thinking so that we're not investing in the stranded assets of the, of the future. We have to be really careful that as we put more attention onto adaptation, that we don't end up making parts of the developed world even more vulnerable to the risks that people will um, leave those parts of the world even further behind. Right. We have to see this as a way of hoping, uh, helping those countries um, to develop in a, in a clean, green, but also resilient way. And I think it's challenging, but it's a, a challenge that we all have to rise to mm. Uh, to make sure that we are dealing with issues of um, environmental justice. Emma, can you just go into a little more detail um, about the relationship between emission reductions and adaptation? Because it, it, is it really quite as simple as the quicker we reduce our emissions and the deeper reductions that we achieve the less we have to invest in adaptation because there's an inverse relationship between those two. Is it as simple as that or is there something more complex? I think it is more complex because there's so much climate change locked in already that if we, as we go ahead and make those investments in reducing our emissions, if we're not thinking about those investments through a resilience lens, we risk investing in energy efficient buildings that get washed away in a flood or melt in a heat right. wave. And that is so important that people understand. When I really started understanding my role in 
bringing the adaptation agenda to the fore was when I was asked because of my financial background to sit on the UK government's green finance task force. This was all about helping finance the clean growth agenda. But I kept on using that little phrase because it had become more and more clear to me chairing the Environment Agency how much we are already seeing in this country the impact, the physical risks of yeah. a changing climate. And those aspects have to go hand in hand. So when we are doing our contracting now for some of our flood schemes, we are also making sure that we're procuring in a low carbon way. Because I think for too long, we have seen adaptation in one box, and I'm, I'm talking the, you know, the global way, and uh, low carbon transition in another box. We actually need to be integrating that thinking where relevant as, as a way of making sure that we're preparing our investments to be secure for the future. Yeah. And I mean, what's so interesting about the increase in impacts is as the severity increases, then, I mean, I was just looking, this terrible hurricane that's been making its way across the Caribbean, Hurricane Dorian, that then hit the Bahamas and the panic in Puerto Rico when they thought it might hit them, because of course they were hit just 12 months ago. And there was all this like, we can't survive another one. So this idea that these occurrences become regular and you just keep getting whacked and whacked and you can't develop your way out of that. I mean, to come out of that cycle, of course, we need mitigation, but we're also going to need proper investment in those places, as you've said. And I'm really curious about, you know, some of that will be bilateral money. It'll be development money to help those countries as it should be. But we also have to find a way to unlock serious amounts of private sector money to actually deploy in that way. And you've got a finance background. I, I've kind of wondered for a while, you know, the, the mitigation agenda has a business case, right? You invest in a solar panel, you get an income stream from that, it pays back the money, it's kind of clear. What's the, or is there a clear answer to the question of how does the investor capture the benefit of building resilient infrastructure? Can you talk us through that? Or is there, is there lots of different ways that happens? I think there are lots of different ways, yeah. but I still think we need to put more attention to how we unlock uh, some of the cash flows that are needed to mm. make, particularly in developed world and de in the developed world, more investment coming from the, the, the private sector. Things like the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures has really helped. And the best example I've come across is where Bloomberg as a business, on the back of Hurricane Sandy and the what happened to their um, key facility, where all the servers were down in the basement Is and got Manhattan? flooded. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. They have now said that in a two degree world, they need to add something like 10% additional capital expenditure to make sure that their key facilities are resilient to climate change. Wow. Now, what we don't want is lots of individual companies making their buildings right. resilient without thinking about the cities, the communities in which they're, that they're, that they're located. Because very quickly you can see that you might get people to that particular building, but when there's another weather event, another flooding, they may not be able to get home. Or people may not be able to get yeah, there because be all of the other it belongs to a private, and, you know, yeah. And all the other bits of infrastructure that make a city so yes. vibrant are not better protected to those sorts of climate change events. So I'm wondering whether there is a model where you take at a city level rather than a Bloomberg or a bank or an accounting firm spending 10% additional capital expenditure to make that building, their building resilient, whether there's a way of pooling that hmm. so that the communities as a whole become more resilient to the changing environment. And Perhaps they may not need to spend as much of that, uh, uh, of that. So I think we need to get clever, cleverer in the way that we're thinking about resilience and start unlocking these flows. 
I also think it's important that we need to look at nature-based solutions as well, because we know from the work that we've done here in the in the UK around our flood schemes that people don't want to be living behind ever higher walls. Mm. So something, sometimes it's about what you do at a building level. Sometimes it's about uh, how you go up the catchment of a river and use nature-based solutions to slow down the flow so that communities are protected in a different way way something's about it's about farming methods so we have i've visited farms where the soil is so compacted that it is no longer absorbing rainwater and some changes in farming practices may mean that that water uh, goes into the soil and creates a healthier soil mm. a healthier environment for farming and also slows the flow uh, down into the catchment and protects, can help over time protect a community from flooding. So we need to look at so many different yeah. ways of protecting our communities and seeing how we unlock those almost community cash flows because you are going to save money by building in resilience over time mm. because even if a house or a business is flooded, if you've thought about its resilience, you may be able to get back in quicker and your disruption to your business may be reduced if you've done it right. So I think we have to look in a very transformational way about the way we are building in resilience measures. One of the most um, famous um, investments to control flooding is the Thames Barrier. Uh, and I believe it was built way back in 1982 to control uh, flooding or prevent flooding in uh, in Greater London. W why don't you talk us through that? Because it was very visionary to make that investment, which originally I think was somewhere around a 500 million pound investment. Um, but what has happened? What, what has happened since 1982 when we had a certain uh, visibility of what flooding could be? And I, I believe that by now we know that the Thames barriers actually are not, uh, not doing what they were meant to do because of the increasing uh, flooding risk. But what, what has the Thames barrier done for London and what else needs to be done in order to keep London safe? So the Thames barrier was built in the 80s and uh, was really the, the response to the event I talked earlier about back in 1953 to better protect London from a tidal surge. It was originally built to last till 2030, but our current analysis, not just using the barrier, but the system of barriers that protects London and all the property upstream of the barrier and the defences, is set to last until 2070. It was originally built to keep out surges, but it has also been used to protect London by creating extra capacity in the river because it's a tidal river at moments of high rainfall up the Thames catchment. Mm. We are currently and have been for a while working on how we need to continue to protect London out to 2100 through an adaptive pathway analysis. And we're already working with a whole range of different stakeholders to make sure we understand where we need to build a future barrier because of sea level rise and other climate uh, impacts. And we will be monitoring how the Thames barrier continues to protect London into the future mm. because it is such an important bit of critical infrastructure mm. and has already served us so well in keeping London protected from flooding. The one aspect that we need to watch out for, though, is a severe rainfall event over London because uh, the, the barrier works for flooding from the river, but we also need to watch out for potential surface water flooding the other side oh, of the right. barriers. And, and that's something that we continue to work again with our partners here in London to make sure that we are as best prepared for that type of flooding event in mm. the future as well. 
And that risk profile has changed since the 80s when it was built. That wasn't sort of thought to be a risk at the time, but now it is kind of thing. Absolutely. As our understanding of what we are protecting London against and for and our understanding of the different types of flooding um, and how you protect communities in very different ways, we need to make sure that, again, the citizens of London understand that there are different types of flood risk. And even though the barrier will serve a huge purpose for many years to come, that individuals need to understand that risk and be connected to our warning and informing so that if we experience a different type of flooding event, people are still protected in London and in other communities up and down the country. Amazing. Yeah, I I just think it's so interesting, Emma, because you mentioned na- nature-based solutions, and um, and the fact is that we have such a wide gamut of uh, of options or possibilities, all the way from planting and protecting mangroves, all the way to building these enormous, beautiful uh, engineering masterpieces like the Thames Barrier. Um, But what worries me is that I think we keep on underestimating the capacity that either the nature-based or these engineering solutions have to prevent uh, the tragedies that uh, keep on escalating. So, um, So it's probably a combination of all of the different ways in which we can foresee and protect the uh, the vulnerable populations. But what a, what a challenge. Emma, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing of your knowledge and uh, your just one sentence expectation for the release of this report that is coming out. I'm really looking forward for the uh, the world to understand the importance of preparing for these physical risks we have to make sure that we're all thinking about adaptation not just the low carbon uh, emissions story indeed emma thank you very very much thank you thank you it's been a pleasure So that was Emma. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting perspective on what the UK is facing and around the world. What do you what do you guys leave that conversation with? I was a bit shocked uh, to hear her talk about the, the fact that there need to be actually difficult decisions made about whether we rebuild in certain areas. That was pretty striking. And her talking about like us trying to get, develop some empathy with people in developing countries because our food is coming from there. You know, this 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 kind of theoretical stuff all becomes very real and quite personal. So that was that was quite a surprise for me. Um, I mean, I, it it struck me that this is such an important agenda, and it's kind of shocking that it's been so hard to get senior attention on it. You know, this report that came out that, 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 that she referenced as well and that we've talked about before demonstrates some really serious impacts that are coming in the next decades. And of course, we need to do everything we can to make sure that those impacts are minimised. But to a degree, we can't minimise them down to zero. So some of those impacts are going to be there. And I think she is playing a role where she is trying to get government to really understand why this is important. She's trying to really get them to understand why they need to take action and raise the international attention to it. And I was kind of a little shocked to find that that attention wasn't already there. I mean, there will come a time in the coming years where this becomes an issue of national security and this becomes a major issue of of economic security and economic development. And that is kind of coming at us in an entirely inevitable way now. And Emma sees it and she's trying to raise the alarm in government and around the world and it's it's kind of shocking that more people aren't listening and hopefully with this report next week and things we can do we need to raise attention to that because while mitigation is super important and our focus needs to be 100 percent on that as she said we cannot forget this agenda um we're going to be facing a massive humanitarian crisis if we do and and on that point um tom maybe it's worthwhile to just share or underline some of the statistics that are coming out of this report. We're not going to spill all the beans, but I think there are some really crucial points there that are worthwhile underlining. For example, that climate change, assuming that we're not going to do any more than is promised under Paris, 
is going to diminish agricultural yields around the world by a whopping 30 percent by 2050. I mean, you just you just have to stop a moment and understand what that actually means. 30 percent less food on this planet by 2050, by which time we may have 2 billion more people. Right. 20 percent more people and 30 percent less food. 30 percent less food. Or the fact that we're going to go from 3.6 billion people who have no access to clean water today to 5 billion in 2050. I mean, you have to really comprehend what that means when we think that we are progressing to the point where, of course, in just a few years, everyone is going to have access to clean water. No, not so. Given this, we're actually going to have more people not having access to clean water than we did at the beginning of the century. How is that possible? Just to clarify on that one, so those 3.6 billion people have some access to water, but throughout the year there is at least one time when they are water-stressed. And apart from anything else, isn't there 7.5 billion people on the planet? So 3.6 billion people is, is half of the world's population. Half do not have, let's say, not access. Let's say they don't have guarantee of clean water. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that is shocking. And the fact, as you say, that that's going to go up to five is unbelievable. Or the fact that we're going to have more than $1 trillion, I'm assuming per year, in physical damages, which means we're going to be forcing hundreds of millions of people to be to flee their homes involuntarily, displaced. I mean, we have to really understand the impact of this. These are statistics that are not just numbers. This is quality of life of human beings that are going to suffer the likes of which we have never seen. And we tend to just gloss over this as though they were numbers that don't really have any meaning or any impact. And we can't do that anymore. We have a saying to try and explain how this plays out, that, that climate change is like the shark that threatens us, but, but water are the teeth, you know, that, that actually kind of do the damage. And um, I, I think we also have a duty to, to be optimistic. We have to probably recognize that the public understanding of climate change is accelerating faster than any time I've ever seen it before. And this report will help to further complete the picture for people that we have a massive mitigation challenge and we have an enormous adaptation challenge. And those two sit together and a part of the, the new economy we're going to build that will actually um, get us out of a kind of economic flat spot uh, as we invest large amounts of money into uh, reducing our carbon emissions, preparing for this new world. And that actually might, at the end of 20 or 30 years, be a great thing for the economy and the world. No, that's, that's a great point. And it is important to kind of end on that, which is that this report highlights some of these really damaging risks that we're facing. But it also makes the point that we are within the, the range of time in which we can really make a difference. By investing now, we can really minimise those risks. We can really make a difference to the kind of worlds we're going to live in in the next few decades. So it's very timely in that regard, and we should, we should pay attention. Therefore, in order to raise further awareness, here is a, uh, a very enthusiastic call for everyone to join the strikes that are coming up on the 20th and on the 27th of September, both of them Fridays. Certainly a lot of attention is going to be on New York because that's where the climate summit is going to take place. But these strikes will be all over the world. So find out where the closest strike is to you. And if there's not one close, start one right in front of your house. Great. All right. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye. So it just remains for me to say that Outrage and Optimism is a production of Global Optimism and is produced by Clay Carnell. The team includes Pete Clutton-Brock, Chloe Revel, Natasha Rivikarnak, Marina Mancilla, Callum Green, and Zoe Cholakantic. I'd also like to thank Nigel Topping and Michael Northrop. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and please do hit subscribe and leave us a review. We also love the feedback, podcast at globaloptimism.com. So many of you have been writing in, and we do try to respond to every email. Thanks for that kind of feedback. We really appreciate it. Please keep them coming. We'll see you next week. <laughs>